about what's going on in Maui, and uh, it kind of fits into this anyway. So uh, there, as you know, there was a significant fire there, and I, I, the death toll continues to rise. There's over 115, um, lots of people un unaccounted for. We have Alliance chaplains there. We don't have an Alliance church in Maui, but there's chaplains that are there involved in the efforts. Uh, many, he says, who fled to the ocean drown. Uh, the likelihood of finding them is low. People caught in what was essentially a crematorium, they're calling it. Uh, just a devastating thing. Uh, so he's, they're asking for prayer as, as you are praying for them, pray for spiritual recovery for responders as well as for the people who live there as it's very traumatic for all involved. Uh, as well as for the chaplains and different authorities and different relief organizations. Kama Services is there. That's the relief arm of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And so if you, beyond praying, want to give to that, you can do that at any time. You can designate that as C-A-M-A uh, and your check, and we send it out every month. That goes to a disaster relief, and they are there providing support as they are able to do so. So pray for that, and I just wanted to make you aware of that so you can know kind of what's going on with people that we are familiar with there. But this morning, we will be in Romans chapter 10. We've been in a summer selection series, kind of uh, whatever I kind of felt like. <laughs> but uh, how as the Lord has been leading and as I've been thinking and, and thinking about the year and just what's coming up and all these things, these are where he has led me. And so yesterday I was at the state fair. Some of you wouldn't go there no matter what. But uh, I always... <laughs> I always enjoy going. It's kind of a, a fun event for us as a family. And um, boy, there's people. There are people. And what it does is it, it, it kind of reminds me of like just the diversity, but just the, the vast number of people that there are, you know? And uh, the fact that there is, there is a huge mission field. And um, as you look over this mass of people, just there's so many different people there, so many different lives and views, and just, it's incredible. And that fits into missions for us. As we kind of think about this morning our role as believers in this world, the question that I want us to kind of consider is, what is our responsibility? You know, do we have any responsibility to the world? And of course the answer is yes, right? If you've read the Bible at all, you know Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations. That's a large task. All nations, 196 or however you want to count them, countries, over maybe 27,000 or more different people groups. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations because he came for all people. It's really that simple. The most remote jungles or the easy access we have to some places around here are people that God loves us. And so we have a call, a mandate, an obligation, a commission to go. Jesus said, go. Jesus said, serve. Jesus said, love it does not exclude our community, but it starts here and it goes from here out to all these different places all around the world that we have people and we continue to go because every lost soul matters. And it's a tragedy when the light that we have in Jesus doesn't get to be shared with some people. That's what it's all about. There was an article in the most recent Alliance Life asking the question, is the trouble worth it? Is the trouble worth it? Here's what he says, a couple of comments from that article. He says, we want to see, this is Tim Crouch, uh, working in the national office. We want to see all of Jesus for all the world. But what remains to be done is probably some of the hardest work we'll ever do. There are years in which we have had difficulty keeping boots on the ground. And in many places that were once some of the safest fields to do ministry. And many people still lacking gospel access live in places where it is hard for outsiders to bring gospel presence. There is a reason that the world's remaining unreached people remain unreached. It's because they're hard to reach. Back 50 years ago, there was a guy by the name of Ralph Winter who coined the term unreached peoples. And he encouraged us to pay attention to the peoples who have yet to have the opportunity to hear the gospel. After so many years, the question still is, how do we do that? Out of nearly... 700 Alliance International Workers today, 80% of them are in locations where the world's most unreached populations are. 
and over two-thirds of them serve directly among what we call unreached peoples. It's a long-term, difficult, dangerous task. 96% of unreached peoples live out their lives in homelands with little or no gospel access, and God is not done calling his own to live out gospel presence among them. Here's an example. Today there are 40, he he says, consider these examples. Among these unreached peoples are like little subculture groups. There are, for example, 43 million blind people in the world, 430 million deaf people, 650 million disabled, 300 million immigrants, 150 million orphans, 685 million people living in extreme poverty, meaning they live on less than $2.50 a day, 1.2 1.2 billion people living in multidimensional poverty, which is based on their health, education, living standards. 160 million people addicted to alcohol or drugs with over 100,000 overdose deaths in the U.S. last year alone. We may never be, he says this at the end of the article, more like Jesus than when we serve the overlooked or outcast group in his love. The life-changing gospel of Jesus at work among the, every, the everywhere present but often overlooked is what we need to be about. So is it, is it worth it? Is the trouble worth it? What if every person, in, even in Battle Lake, knew that God loved them, like really loved them? Do you think it would change anything? The church needs to stay focused on the mission. There's plenty of fringe issues. There's plenty of things to get wound up about, but really what's the mission? Romans chapter 10 is where we're going to be. And, and as we can kind of think about mission, we think about what it says the gospel is. What is the gospel? What are we even about? Here's what it says. Romans 10, starting in verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So we want to let people hear. And so I want to look at what this says here today, this whole idea of salvation. What is salvation, and and, and what do we do with it? Well, here's what it says, right? First, let's see if I get this to go here. Can you you start that over there, Bob, so I can... Where does salvation come from, and how do we receive it? That's the first question. Confession, he says, comes with our mouth. Jesus is Lord. It's a confession. It's an agreement. It's an an agreeing with God that God said about Jesus is, in fact, true. Matthew chapter 16. Is it not going to go? I'm going to just restart that program. Matthew chapter 16. I'll read it. If we get the screen on, it'll be up there, but I can read it. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 16. Maybe it's this. Yeah. Um, all right, Matthew, that's okay. You know, sometimes technology just doesn't want to cooperate, and that's cool. That's cool. You know? All right. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others. Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Jesus kind of comes to them and asks them this question. First first kind of basic question. Who are people saying I am? Number one. And number two, what about you? Like, There's all this stuff out there in the world, but what do you say? Who do you say that I am? What is your confession about Jesus? And he says, 
You are the Lord. You are the Christ. We confess things. The first part of this in Romans is confession. Confession says, I believe. And I want people to know that I believe. We make public confessions in our life. Like at a, a wedding, for example. You know, when I got married, I confessed to God, to my wife, to my, to my wife and to those in attendance, that I will love, honor, and cherish her as long as I live and we live and her alone. Confession lets the world know that I am no longer single. So, you know, back off, right? Believer, no. In believers, baptism is one of the things we do in public. We last week had a service out by Alan Sharon's that publicly declared for two people in our church that they desire to follow Jesus. It's a way to confess. Confession is a part of what we do. It matches kind of our heart with what we say. We, we declare this with our mouth, but also our heart says, yes, I believe and I confess. Notice he says here that we confess with our mouth and we believe. There's a difference in believing in something and believing on something. Here's what I mean. The Bible tells us that the devil believes in God. The demons believe in God. They know that he exists. And it says that they tremble. So they believe he exists. We know a lot of people in the world who will say things like, I believe there's a higher power. I believe that there, maybe there's a God out there. But they're not believing on Football season starting, so it's not too soon to talk about the Packers. Well, okay, I guess, yeah, right. I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, those who don't know that, and I uh, am a Green Bay Packers fan because of it. That's just a part of who I am. Now, I believe, as you do if you're a Vikings fan, you believe that your team will show up to the game for 60 minutes. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But I don't believe on them for anything. Like, I don't, I don't lose my life if they don't win, thankfully. Nothing changes about my life if they lose the game. The game is a game. It does not change my life. It does not give me any, any real change at all, except for maybe a little stress, if you're really into it. But if you believe on someone, you trust them completely. To believe in Jesus is to believe on Jesus, that he is the anointed one, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one in whom is found salvation, and I can rest in him, I can depend on him, I can cling to him, I can change my life based on who he is. My life before Christ and after Christ looks different. Doesn't it? And so the question that, it gets, gets, that we need to consider is, as a church, or as people of God, what are we doing with Jesus Christ? The essence of our belief is this, that he went to the cross and he rose again so that we can have eternal life. God's requirement was not, hey, do the best you can. How well does that work? Do the best you can, live your best life. You know, it's okay. No, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because your good works don't save you because if you could earn your salvation by good works, then why put Jesus on the cross to begin with in anguish? The cross settles it. He rose again, and we rejoice because that means we can live with him forever. Without a resurrection, there's no salvation. God takes faith and counts it as righteousness. And so we see here, everyone then is able, if they receive, to, to receive Jesus. They are able to if they desire. There's an emphasis here on everyone that the Lord of all blesses all who call on his name. Everyone, anywhere who calls on him can be saved. The offers for all, rich or poor, black, white, whatever, everyone. You, me, the annoying neighbor, your coworker, all those people in your life that you struggle to love, that I struggle to love are people who he loves. Jesus offers, it says, a shame-free life. In verse 11 it says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put 
to shame. Do you know what it feels like to be ashamed? You ever kind of walk around thinking like, boy, if these people knew what I carry, what I've done, Ashamed of your family background, maybe ashamed of some things you've done. I don't know what it all means. But being ashamed by the ways that we treat each other. I know I've been ashamed at times of the way that I have represented Jesus. Because it hasn't been perfect or great sometimes. And the context here is really interesting because it is Jews and Gentiles. Paul is calling out Gentiles as people who are able to reach others. That's huge because, remember, they didn't always get along very well. Right? The Jews and the Gentiles didn't always see things eye to eye. But in verse 11, as I just read, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Anyone who trusts in him. It's impossible to understand all this in our current culture, I think. But families break down. Things erode. Relationships that we thought were good are no longer good. And we think, like, God, how can you possibly accept me? How can you possibly accept me in what I've done and what I've thought? Why wouldn't God be ashamed? But this says never. that He will never put you to shame. If you trust in him, if you give your life to Jesus, he comes in and you are not put to shame. There's other places where we see this. For example, back in Romans chapter 8, in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the key. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit no condemnation he says in fact Jesus back in John chapter 3 right after the famous verse everybody memorizes John 3 16 in John 3 verse 17 says this for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. No condemnation in Christ. Do you know anyone who needs to hear that? Do you need to hear that? That there's level ground at the cross, that we come with the same issue, the same problem, we need the same Savior. He looks at us through the same eyes. Jews and Gentiles, same Lord, same standard. That all people are saved by the same promise, by the same means, if they decide to trust and follow him, if they go and receive him as he's called. Don't let our own ideas... Confused. When Jesus says he loves you, he means he does, in fact, love you, and he blesses you in that. So we're back to where we started. What responsibility do we have to the nations? In light of what we have been given and the hope we have, what is our task? What is our job? Why do we exist? One of the highlights, I mentioned this before, but of general counsel, every two years the Alliance has general counsel, is the missions rally because the Alliance workers that are there, carry their country flags and dress in their you know, country gear and all that, and they walk around and we celebrate in worship kind of where they are, what they're doing, and how God is moving. And we send new workers. And one of the things that always happens is there's like you know, another 20, 30, I think it was almost 50 this year, new, new workers that were commissioned to go um, to these unreached people, to these hostile places. In fact, I have a couple examples that were just sent out from uh, Kama Services. Got a gal, for example, named Faith, who is going to Nicaragua. For the first time, Kama and the U.S. Lions has sent someone to Nicaragua. And the goal here is to open a church-based health care clinic with a multicultural team. Sully and Natalie are going to Indonesia 
They said that while they grew up in, in Indonesia, Sully and Natalie learned about Kama through the parents of a friend. And as they got older, they felt God's calling on them to, again, do ministry overseas. God drew us, and he has given us a love for the people. We desire to see other unreached areas of Indonesia come to Christ. Their hope is that through holistic community development, communities will encounter and want to join Jesus in his kingdom. The Middle East. A gal that's just being called Heidi is stepping forward in faith and responding to the call that God has been laying on her heart. She says, Kama allows me to use my skills that I have already have and develop new skills as I seek to minister in tangible ways, felt needs, and praying that this will ultimately lead to others experiencing Christ. Heidi's yes to the Lord's leading will bring the light of the gospel to a region that is like 93% unreached. She's teaching English, assisting with women's ministry, marketing, other different business things there. Finally, there's another, and there's many more, but Scott and Deanna Blackwell going to Senegal. Uh, both of them wanted to go overseas since they were young, and God has continued to point on their lives the direction they needed to go. And so they're going with this business model to kind of go and to do some woodworking trade, small business, teach some skills, and provide opportunities for young men specifically, to interact with them and meet Jesus. And that's just like a couple of many stories of people who are going, who are giving their lives to go and be a part of that. See, the gospel is needed, it says, everywhere. In verse 12, the gospel is needed everywhere, today, right now. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. The task of sending workers to ministry must not stop because the work of preaching the gospel must not stop. In the early days of the Alliance, uh, A.B. Simpson made a comment. He said, Christians, if Christians would live together and work together as God intended, the job would be done in a decade. But failure to do that causes apostasies, mistakes, and it's the reason the heathen world is still lying in darkness and crying to God against the unfaithfulness of his people. So think about that. He, he's, he's saying if we would just work together, we'd get the job done. Instead, we like to fight about different things and finer points and get all kinds of sideways. Spurge, Charles Spurgeon said we cannot be unfaithful when there are souls on the line. There's too much at stake. We need to have pity and longing in our hearts for the souls to be saved, especially when the gospel is in our hands and our hearts, that we have it right here. Do you feel compassion for the souls of men? Our message will outlast our structures, our programs, our ministries. The message ultimately is where we will see the work completed of making disciples of all nations and the return of our King. The message does not stop when we walk out the doors or we shut things down in here and we go about our lives. No, the message must go out from us. Daily lives, everything we do, proclaiming Christ. There are plenty of people without Jesus, and so we pray for conversions. We pray that the work of the devil is defeated, that our neighbors and city and family and friends would know Jesus, would, would be able to find hope and change and life and freedom from addictions and problems and issues, whatever it might be they would find that there's life in Jesus. We all need him. We all know that we need him, and then we have concern for our world. We need unity and grace because things are challenging. I, I'm already kind of um, uh, not looking forward to the next political season, are you? <laughs> it just creates so much chaos because there's a message that is needed, and it's not political, and it's the gospel. God's word changes lives. He says the feet are beautiful of the ones who send good news because they are actively participating in seeing people receive eternal life. We can partner with God for the salvation of men. Our feet, our, our activity, our motion, what we're doing in our lives, we're doing something, we're a part of it. It's not just programs. It's not just like the church does that and I go home. It's, it's our lives that we're called to go and be everywhere. It used to be that you could put out like a, a board, you know, out by the road. Hey, church Sunday, 10 a.m., people would come. 
and some people still do, but for the most part, it takes something else. It takes some, something inside. We're busy. We don't need another event to do. We want to use our time for valuable things. And so what is valuable to us? All of us are active participants in this. We reach out to everyone everywhere. May, Matthew 28 19 literally says, as you are going, make disciples. As you are living your life, as you are going to sporting events and going to the grocery store and just being a part of the world around you, make disciples. You have opportunities every day to bridge that gap. Maybe it's just a simple, like, hey, a, a blessing on someone, a praying for someone, encouraging someone. It's not just, hey, come to church. Although it can, that can be part of it. That's not all it is. So we look for ways to engage the culture around us, meet needs, find needs, serve as we can serve, show people we love them without agenda. It's not like, here, I'm giving you this, and now you need to come do this thing. No, it's, it's we just want you to know that you are loved. And when we do that, people are attracted to Jesus. That's what he's about. The tough places we're going, we're going there for a purpose. At the end of that same article that he asked the question, he says this, Now, to the hard places. The world's remaining unreached peoples have disadvantaged access to the good news of the, Jesus Christ. Over 4,000 distinct groups still lack gospel access, remaining in locations where 90% of their population will never migrate. Like, they're there, they're staying there, we need to go to them. The time is now for the gospel advance to the world's hardest places. Time is now. It's a challenge for us. How can we engage our world? How can we engage the culture? How can we bring the truth of the gospel to the world that needs to hear this? It's a question for us to consider as you go into fall ministry. Souls literally hang in the balance and we must be engaged, have a passion and concern about the lostness of mankind. That Lord, the Lord would give us a heart that he has and the other side of that is this. If you are here and you're like, I, I don't even know Jesus, this is a call for you as well. To say, yes, I want to confess and believe. I want to trust and know him. I want to walk with him. I want to know who he is. And so we find ways to expand outside of the walls and the community in faithfulness. To take Jesus to the world everywhere, for everyone, and to give us a heart for that. So I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord, the call is specific but challenging because we recognize the, just the great diversity that's out there and the challenges in that. Mindsets and views and all these things that are, are, are playing into how people are living. And Lord, help us to have a heart for truth, have a heart for people, to desire to love and, and, and make sure the message is clear as we go into our world, into our workplaces, our schools, our, just our daily lives. Lord, give us the opportunity to be a presence there, to be a gospel presence there, a light that shines in the darkness. Even if we don't say much, that we can just live in that and we can give that away. And Lord, would you call people to yourself Call people around us. Open doors for us to share the truth of the gospel. Because it's, so, it's, it's just so simply stated. We can confess and believe and we can find freedom and eternal life. Do pray for people here listening, maybe here today, who are not even sure they know Jesus, not even sure they have ever found salvation. Would, would you call them today to yourself that is simply to confess, to agree. You are, Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, and I surrender. And as we do, Lord, you come in and you change us. We turn from our sins and we walk with you. We find there's wholeness and new life there. So call people to yourself. We love you and thank you that you are a trustworthy God, that you don't ever fail, you don't ever make mistakes, you're never weary or, or tired or bored with us or any of those things. You are continuing to be faithful and true and loving. So, Lord, call people. And, Lord, again, 
everywhere, everywhere that we go, that you would give us opportunities to share that hope we have. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Invite our music group up here as we conclude with a song, the song that celebrates the faithfulness of God. I invite you to stand and join us.